For those of you who maybe don't know me or my family, I have a picture of us up here. There we are at Easter. That's our dog, Lucy. She is an English boodle, so half English bulldog, half poodle, also known as a mutt from the shelter, but she's really cute. My two boys, Benjamin the oldest, Brooks the youngest, me and Amanda. What you don't see in this picture is that about two minutes prior to this picture being taken, Lucy took off running, Benjamin was holding the leash, she dragged him through a giant puddle of mud, his whole backside is covered in mud, her feet are all muddy, and we're still smiling for the most part anyway. (laughs) You can also see in this picture that we're kind of a unique family. Some of us are very tall and some of us are less tall. (laughs) Three of us have dark hair. Brooks has, as he would describe, orange hair. Some love sports. My wife is the consummate Baylor fan. Some of us are a little more into music and the arts and the kids are somewhere in between. We have a lot of unique things about us. Amanda often jokes that we are kind of the perfect pundit square from biology in high school where you take the two sets of genes and swirl them together and let's see what the kids are going to come out like. (laughs) And so we have these two fun boys who have certainly their own uh, unique personalities. A lot of differences, but together we make up one family and we love each other. So what happens when we take all of this wonderful diversity and uniqueness that each of us brings and bundle it all together? Well, for the most part, it works, until it doesn't. Uh, Sometimes there can become some tension when one of us gets a little carried away with, I need it to be done my way. (laughs) Whether that's how the house gets cleaned or how a board game gets played or how we interact with one another. Sometimes maybe it's from too much of a good thing, too much time together, too much time with family, maybe too high of expectations for a holiday or for a vacation that we have to have everything just perfect. And so it puts all of us a little on edge. But at the end of the day, love covers it. Because at our core, we know that we love each other and that we have each other's backs. I'll never forget what Benjamin told Brooks on Brooks' first day of kindergarten. Benjamin's in second grade. Benjamin looked at Brooks very seriously in the car on the way to school, and he said, now, Brooks, you let me know if anybody messes with you, and I'm going to take care of them. (laughs) Truth of the matter is, Benjamin is probably the one that messes with Brooks more than anyone else, (laughs) but they love each other. Now, what happens when we bring those same kinds of family dynamics into the family of God? When we bring it into the body of Christ, I I fear that sometimes we have unrealistic expectations for what that might look like. Unrealistic expectations for each other and for us together. But Jesus gives us some clear lessons in today's passage about how we can maintain unity and why this matters, why this is so important. So today we're going to be talking about becoming one, and truthfully, it's a story that's all about love. Not in the like Hallmark Christmas movie kind of sense, but it's in the story of God and his people and the unifying power of love that we share together through the Holy Spirit. For context, over the past several weeks, we've been talking about Jesus and his final words of instruction and prayer for his closest followers, whom he would be leaving very soon. As we have read through them, the majority of his wisdom and his instruction and his prayer has centered on love. You you could almost take the Beatles song, like, all you need is love, and play that as the refrain after each one of these scriptures. Today, he gives us a mission, or maybe more accurately, a co-mission. When we think of the Great Commission, what is that? Yeah, go to all the world, make disciples, teaching them what I've taught you, baptizing them. Exactly. The the origin of that word, at least the English version of co-mission, co, 
come, as in to unite, to connect, to combine, to bring together in unity on a mission. Here, Jesus is going to co-mission us together in how we are to interact with each other. So in the first opening verses for today in John chapter 17, we're going to pick up around verse 15. You can turn to that in the Bible uh, in the pew in front of you, or it will be on the screen as well. We see that Jesus is really praying for four things. So the first one is really very practical. Jesus prays that God keeps his followers in the world. If they were not kept in the world, how else would anyone know about Jesus? If every time someone decided to follow Christ, they were raptured up into heaven, it'd be great for them, but it'd be really hard for the faith. It would go extinct almost immediately. So very practical. Jesus says, keep them in the world. Secondly, also very practical, Jesus says, prays to keep his from the evil one. We know that the evil one's whole plan is to steal and kill and destroy. And his greatest trick is to deceive those to whom God has spoken. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, the evil one was twisting the words of God, causing confusion, causing doubt, causing rebellion. Jesus prays that his followers would be guarded and kept safe from that. Keep them in the world, Keep them protected from the evil one. Third, he says, and this is a little more complex, he prays that his followers would be sanctified by truth. Sanctified is kind of a a weird word for us in English, and, and especially those of us who maybe have grown up in different traditions of the church. What does it mean to be sanctified? If we look at what that word really comes from, it's the same word some of your and other traditions may say, consecrated or set apart made holy. But it's not necessarily holiness in the way that we kind of associate that. It's it's about being set aside for a particular purpose. Throughout the Old Testament, we see things are, are consecrated, sanctified as being set aside for service to God. That applies to people, that applies to things. And Jesus is saying that we are to be sanctified, that we are to be set aside for a purpose. And we'll do that through the truth. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy, same word there, sanctified, set apart, consecrated nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Jesus says that we are to be set apart, sanctified by the truth of the of God. And I could spend the rest of the morning just on this one phrase talking about it, but I won't. Let me just say, in your minds, think about Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Jesus is saying here that I will sanctify you, I will set you apart for a purpose through your belief in me as I live in you. All right, kept in the world protected from the evil one, sanctified by truth, and the fourth one, that they're being sent into the world. I think most of us are probably keenly aware of our mission to the world, the Holy Spirit's mission within us as we recited the Great Commission this morning, as we read about in the book of Acts. Last week, Pastor Nate preached about the role of the Holy Spirit among believers in the world. The remainder of today's passage kind of picks up on that theme, telling us that beyond being sent on a mission to the world, there is also a mission toward one another as believers. That there is something that is unique about the way we interact with one another as believers that will show the world that Christ has come from the Father to show his love to the world. We heard in today's scripture reading that Christ's desire is for his body of believers to be one. 
as the physical body of believers here on earth, part of our mission is to care for one another. If you ever look up one another, that phrase in Scripture, you will find it all over the place. I think we have a slide with uh, some of the different ways that we will see one another. Most of those times are in relation to how we are commanded to interact with each other as believers. These commands form the basis of Christian community. How we interact with one another has a direct impact on our witness to the world outside of the body of Christ. Yet we're all so different. Aren't we doomed before we begin to have discord, to have disunity? to have jealousy, to want to get our own way. There's a little church in the town that I grew up in that had such a fight over the color of the carpet when they redid their sanctuary that they ended up having green carpet out where the pews were and blue carpet up on the platform. It was a horrendous eyesore. <laughs> it's still there today. If you go visit Sulphur, Louisiana, uh, you'll see it. A, a testimony to disunity and attempts at compromise. Ever since the Garden of Eden, fallen human nature being what it is, says that where there's variance, that where there's diversity, then there's going to be discord, there's going to be unity, and that's just the way it is, and we have to accept it. We see it with Cain and Abel. Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, and on and on we could go. This challenge even is present in the early church as we read through the New Testament and all of these epistles that are being written to the early church addressing struggles that they are having between Jews and Gentiles, men and women, rich and poor, the distribution of spiritual gifts, and on and on. And we know from our experience that when we accepted Christ, and became part of his body, we we didn't lose immediately our unique personalities. We didn't lose our free will. We still have disagreements. We still see things differently. But what gets us into trouble is when we start making it a big issue, when we start casting each other in a negative light. But if we look deep within... I think we often find that the seeds of, those dis- of that disunity is really rooted in our own insecurity. It's our jealousy for what others have, our insecurity about ourselves and what we do or don't have. James asked it this way, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. We can have unity. We can be one without being the same, but it requires effort on our part and the work of the Holy Spirit within us to grow us strong in unity, which brings us to really the focus of our text today. Still in John chapter 17, Picking up at verse 20. Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone, not just for the disciples, but for all those who will believe in me through their message. Jesus is talking about us, those of us who have believed in Jesus because of the message that we received handed down faithfully from the apostles. Verse 21, that all of them may be one. The prayer here is that we will be one. It's a prayer for unity. But as we'll see, he doesn't necessarily mean carbon copies here. That they will be one just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us. Here we see Jesus' desire that that we would reflect the nature of the Trinity. He's inviting us into that mystical relationship In the Trinity, there's one essence, one substance, but three distinct persons, each with with unique qualities and primary functions, but always complete singleness and unity of purpose. It's into that kind of relationship that, that Christ invites us to live in God 
and with each other. Why? Jesus says, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The result of us living so radically different from the culture of the world around us is that the world will be able to recognize Jesus in us and know that he was sent by the Father. Think back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Bringing this message of God loving the world and sending his Son, that's our unifying mission. This is the ultimate purpose before us. To borrow Paul's language in 2 Corinthians, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. He's given us a message and ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people back to God. For Christ's love compels us. Verse 22, continuing, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. It seems kind of interesting that in the middle of talking about this unity and us being one, all of a sudden Jesus kind of throws in some glory language here. It feels out of place. What does glory have to do with it? A lot of theologians link the glory of God to the love of God. In context here, it certainly seems to make sense where we're talking about love, 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 that the glory of God would be in context here as part of love. If we go back to the Old Testament, when God is really beginning to reveal himself to his people, we see that his glory is often associated with love, with mercy, and compassion. If we look at Exodus chapter 33, I think we have it up here on a slide. Moses has just led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's on his way to the promised land. And Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and is talking with God. And he says to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the people on the face of the earth? Moses is asking, what is going to be the distinguishing characteristic of your people to know that you have truly brought us out of bondage and have called us to be your own? What's going to make us different from the rest of the people on the earth? In verse 17, the Lord says to Moses, I will do the thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. All of God's goodness, his glory, is going to manifest in Moses' presence. It's going to pass before him as the Lord declares his name to Moses. As he tells them what will distinguish them from all the other peoples of the earth. If we go to the next chapter in Exodus, chapter 34, we read that then the Lord comes down in the cloud and stands there with Moses proclaiming his name. Verse 6, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. God is saying, this is who I am. This is my defining character. And we'll see that throughout the rest of Scripture as God interacts with his people again and again, revealing himself as the compassionate God, the God who is filled with love, the God who keeps his promises to a thousand generations. And this is the glory of God that will set him and his people apart from all the other peoples on the earth. The ultimate expression of the glory of God is his great love. And because of and through the power of this love, we are invited in to be one with him. 
Going back to today's passage, verse 23. Jesus says, let's get a run into it. Let's go back to verse 22 just real quick. He says, there we go. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity. So what are we reading here? What is this complete unity that we see? He goes on to say that the world will know you've sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory that you've given because you loved me. So what's this outcome that he's talking about? Jesus says, so that we can be brought into this complete unity. Be brought. That, that sounds like a process. It sounds like something that's going to take some time and some effort. Unity is never accidental. It doesn't just happen. It must be intentional. And in this passage, Jesus repeatedly tells us that it should be a priority of his church. John picks up on this theme in his epistle to the early church in first. It's a letter that he's writing about the basics of faith, helping the church to answer the question, are we true believers? John says to them, in essence, if you boil down first John, that if you love one another, that's evidence of God's presence in your lives. And if you bicker and you quarrel and you fight with one another, that's a good indication that you don't, in fact, know God. John doesn't say that you have to be perfect in it, but he says you need to be working on it, admitting your sins, seeking God's forgiveness, depending on God for cleansing from guilt, admitting wrongs against others, and making amends with each other. John talks extensively about the relationship between God's love for us and our love for each other and the process of it being perfected in us. In 1 John chapter 4, he writes, If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. Jesus concludes in our passage for today in verse 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you've sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus continues to make the love of God known through us, through the spirit of truth promised to us, through the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. The Holy Spirit reminds us of the truth of God's love for Jesus and for us. So how does all of that look in practice? All right, we've talked a lot of theory about love and the importance of loving one another, but how do we tangibly do that? I have three kind of take-home points from that. The first is the love and acceptance of Christ. When we have discord, when there's tension, when there's disunity, the hardest part of fixing that is often taking the first step to initiate it. Especially if you feel like you're the person who's been wronged, to have to go and say, hey, let's work on this. Let's make it right. Yet that's exactly what God did for us. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. That he reached out to us first. The hard part's already been done. The first move has already been made through Jesus reaching out toward us. God coming to us in the flesh right where we are and extending his hands of compassion to us. And, and this love that he extends, it, it's perfect. It's complete for all time. 
It's not that he just accepted us as we were on the day that we were saved or that we gave our heart to Christ, which he did do. But he also loved and accepted us at that moment for who we will be, for who we will become, for better or for worse. Richer, poorer, sickness, and in health. He knew the good and he knew the bad. He knew the mistakes that we would make, the sins that we would struggle with. And yet he chose to love us and to accept us, to embrace us as we were, as we are, and as we will be. Let's be careful here. God does love us so much that he doesn't just leave us where we are. Instead, he invites us to grow in holiness. Remember? Consecration, set-apartness for service. He invites us to grow with him in that. But his love covers the full range and timeline of our life. This is not only radical love, but it's radical acceptance by God of us. God loved and accepted us so that we can accept and love him. But we must receive that love and acceptance. It brings us to to the second point. Love and acceptance of self. Sometimes, at least for myself, I can rationally, mentally assent to, okay, God loves me. There seems to sometimes be this disconnect between my head and my heart. The message gets lost between the two. It can be really hard to get into the innermost recesses of our heart. We can struggle to understand, how could you possibly love someone like me? Especially when we struggle to love or accept ourselves. When we fail to do that, there are consequences. Not only for us, but for those who are around us. Our our lack of love and acceptance for ourselves is often rooted in our insecurities. Maybe there's guilt. Maybe there's shame. Maybe there's fear. Many of us go through life with deep emotional wounds. Maybe through the words or actions of others, we've been made to believe that we are the problem, that we are somehow deficient, lacking, defective, or unlovable. Oh, and the enemy loves to use that against us. But we need to see ourselves as the Father sees us. Anything less than that really is is idolatry. It's us kind of putting ourselves on the throne and saying, oh, I know better than God. I know myself better. I'm a better judge of my character. And I know that I am unacceptable, that I am unlovable. But friends, it's a lie. It's the same lie that the enemy has been using since the beginning. Christ came to reveal the truth to us that we are worthy of God's love, that we are worthy of his acceptance, that we are worthy of being called his beloved children. No masks, no pretense, no walls to try to hide ourselves from God or the the feared judgment of others. Pastor Nate preached a few weeks ago that God can heal even deep pains and and scars. And and for some, God may heal instantly, set us free in a a crisis moment of prayer at the altar or at home. But for many more of us, healing may come through the gifts of modern medicine, professional therapy. There's no shame in this. God has given us these resources as a means of his grace to help make us whole. I'll be honest with you. I thank God for, and I regularly pray for my counselor because I see how God uses him in my life. God wants you to be whole, to see yourself as you truly are, to see yourself as God sees you, that you would be known loved and connected to him. 
God knows you, all of you, and he loves you. No less for you than to accept that same love toward yourself. That brings us to our third experience of others. Having experienced for ourselves this love for God, the natural outflow should be to want to do the same for others. As our wounds and insecurities are, are healed, we want to experience in others that healing. We want them to find their security, their wholeness in the one who created them. We stop seeing each other as threats to us, as competition. Love is not a finite commodity like an apple pie or a pizza where there's only so much to go around. Also, people are not a means to an end. We don't use people to find love or fulfill fulfillment, contentment, joy, meaning, status. Love for one another comes by the power of God that is at work in us through the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5, we read about the fruit of the Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. Usually when we think of the fruit of the Spirit, what, what comes to mind? Right, so the nine, right? And the first one there listed is love. If you look at the original Greek, there's not punctuation like we have in English and Greek. And so there are a lot of New Testament scholars, and, and I agree with them, that identifies that the fruit of the Spirit is love. That word fruit is singular. Fruit is, not the fruits are, the fruit is love. Colon. And then we go on with the list of joy, peace, patience, kindness. Those are all explaining what love looks like in its various beautiful facets and manifestations in our lives. One poet put it this way, that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy is love rejoicing. Peace is love at rest. Patience is love waiting. Kindness is love interacting. Goodness is love initiating. Faithfulness is love keeping its word. Gentleness is love empathizing. And self-control is love resisting temptation. Love, in its many facets, is a powerful force and guide for our sense of self-worth and identity, for our treatment of each other, and for our unity as the body of Christ. Love is how we can accept one another, even when we don't necessarily agree on every single thing. We don't have to accept everything that someone believes or understands to still accept them. Love compels us to accept them and others who also uniquely bear the image and the love of our God. This is very different from the, the love and the unity that, that's sold to us kind of by modern culture. This is radical, transformational love. In a world that is so filled with division and disunity and hate, God shows us a different way. When we hear about and reflect on God's love, how can our souls keep from singing? No storm can shake our inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Through the tumult and the strife, I can hear the music ringing. How can I keep from singing? The fruit of the spirit of love equips us to love one another well and to live in peace, harmony, and unity as the family of God. Not because we've all been whitewashed into one-dimensional robots who look and act and think exactly alike, but rather because God has taken a diverse group of people with diverse perspectives and life experiences and backgrounds that come from every nation, tribe, and tongue and knit us together into a beautiful mosaic, a people who've been set apart because they've experienced his love. They accept the truth of his love and dedicate their lives to living 
story of love in which their names are written. Such unity is something that we must work at. It's an ongoing practice. In Ephesians, as we wrap up here, Paul says that Christ himself gave a diversity of gifts and leaders to equip people for works of service until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. By speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Each part must do its work to build up the body of Christ. Each of us must make every effort to keep the unity of peace through the bond of the Spirit. As we close today, I challenge you and me to think about how the Spirit has gifted us. What role is he calling us to play in helping the body to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God? As we go through our week, let's take time to ask ourselves how through thought, word, and deed, each of us can be a unifying presence in the church and in the world.